and cameras otherwise, you're all good. Nice to see you, Hamalia. Okay, so I'm nice gonna... to see you. Thank you. <laughs> cool. I'm gonna sort of mute myself and turn things off because I got to get the rest of the uh, sound set up. Yeah, good. Who's our Omze? I am Lama. Kathy. You're on. Okay. Thanks. The Heart of Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagavan was dwelling on the mass of Vultures Mountain, Rajariya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage who trains lineage train who wish wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom. He said that and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the venerable Shardivada Putra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same ways, feelings, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness. 
without characteristics, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so in and up to, and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on and up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, secession, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom. <coughs> Um, that without my without my mind without obscuration and without fear, having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. And the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in the reliance on the perfection of wisdom. <clears throat> Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of the great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies <clears throat> all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of perfection of wisdom is to care. Tagati gati paragati pamasagati bodhisattva. Tayagate gate paragate parmasagate bodhisavaha. Shariputta, the bodhisattva mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and com commented to the bodhisattva mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just if you have indicated, even the Tagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Shardivati Putra, the Bodhisattva, Marasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding, in their, those surrounding in their entirely, along with the worlds of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Vakavan. Oh, thank you. Very good. <clears throat> uh, tonight's class is um, maybe a little bit shorter because uh, I want to encourage people to um, participate in uh, uh, chanting and doing the Manjushi practice uh, in an hour that Dirk's willing to lead. <clears throat> it's a uh, winter solstice. And then we also have this interesting um, uh, conjunction of planets. And then we're doing phases of the moon. So uh, uh, this is a, a big evening tonight. So. Um, some of you may be up late. I know Dirk will. Thank you very much for leading this. It's wonderful. Um, 
So uh, everyone's invited to the Buddha Nature Talks, the uh, Buddha Dharma Program Talks. Um, uh, but I must admit that uh, I'm assuming that people are reading uh, the text um, so that uh, the lectures, my presentation isn't um, a substitute for reading the text. So I won't explain the text, like go over it so you don't have to read it. But uh, so you do have to read it to um, kind of make sense of what I'm talking about. But uh, for those people that are actively uh, in the program, uh, then there, there will be the essays, right? But uh, if you're not, then you don't have to do the essay, but you still uh, need to read the book. How's that? Is that a deal? Okay. <clears throat> uh, the Buddha Dharma program uh, is unique because it's not just uh, academic. Um, the many fine programs out there, uh, some of us uh, have already done the foundations course that was through Jamyang. Um, but it wasn't necessarily that you had to study with anybody in particular or taken refuge or bodhisattva or tantric vows. And there are other fine schools like Maitripa and Naropa and probably some other uh, some other online programs like uh, Sri Bhuti and things like that. But um, this one is uh, directly uh, for us and uh, very close, right? So that's why um, I feel that it's it's very authentic because we want to integrate training and practice together, um, and scholarship includes is included in the training. So <clears throat> the Buddha nature is a, a really um, big topic. So uh, we're going to settle in and spend uh, more than just a couple of times on it. So uh, you're uh, you're going to know it's a lot of information about Buddha nature anyway, um, but actually, I just want you to realize um, your Buddha nature and become the truth of it. <clears throat> so uh, I'm keeping an eye on the clock uh, so that I'm glancing up <laughs> to the right a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but I definitely want some time for uh, questions and discussions. <clears throat> and one thing uh, uh, I thought I would do for this time uh, is uh, actually put out uh, the questions or the themes for an essay uh, right from the beginning so you don't have to wait in anticipation. You can uh, start. Uh, working on them now. Does that, does that sound fair? <laughs> kind of. <clears throat> so, um, the Gulama, the Mahayana Sutra Lankara, uh, excuse me, the Gulama, um, Uttara Tantra Shastra, uh, brings together a whole bunch of strands. Uh, and refers to different styles of presentation of Buddha nature. So um, like a lot of Indian um, uh, texts, uh, it, it has some, uh, it's like Indian food, you know, it doesn't have just one, <laughs> it doesn't just have one meal. Oh, thank you, I got some tea here. Uh, so um, it's going to say some contradictory things in there, right? Has anybody noticed that already? <laughs> yeah. Um, from the Indian point of view, I think this is not uh, a particular problem. I think uh, the Indian Mahayana point of view enjoyed uh, putting together uh, quite a feast with uh, sometimes spices and sometimes sweets. The Tibetans, however, generally wanted to sort everything out and um, identify different strands of uh, the Buddha nature discussions 
and the different sutras. And I'm going to try to do that a little bit, but um, not tonight. I want to give a broad outline tonight. Is that okay? Well, so. <clears throat> When we're talking about Buddha nature, um, of course, uh, it's English word. Um, uh, it's used sometimes interchangeably for uh, to describe um, what in Sanskrit is called Tathagata Garbha, um, the matrix or the womb uh, of uh, the Tathagata, uh, the thus gone or the thus come. Also, it's sometimes used as a translation for Buddha Dhatu. So uh, the uh, state of uh, Buddha, the qualities and the uh, realizations and the truths uh, that a Buddha experiences. <clears throat> so uh, it's a complex uh, uh, doctrine that uh, is absolutely necessary to um, be familiar with in order to do uh, tantric practice. So, um, particularly in our Sangha and uh, in our Buddha Dharma program, I want people to have both the uh, uh, training uh, from the yogic point of view and the training from the um, study point of view in order to do the practices um, and trainings. Uh, correctly. <clears throat> By training, I mean all the formal uh, yogas we do, both on the cushion and uh, study. Practice means your performance of daily life. Training is a perfect uh, environment where you eliminate all the distractions and all the confounding variables. It's like being in your lab or being in the greenhouse. Uh, so the training aspect of Dharma, the formal part, um, is somewhat perfectionistic because we, we want to teach you how to do it exactly right. We know that in daily life, there are many confounding variables and things are constantly changing. So it's not possible to do it that way. However, in Tantra, we say we blending the training and the performance practice. So in, when I've met with people in Darshan, I say, please first tell me about your training, which means actually what happens when you do the formal yogas, when you're doing your shamatha or tonglen or vipassana or deity yoga, mahamudra, dzogchen, what actually happens? Uh, what's your actual experience uh, when doing your sadhana? <clears throat> so uh, I'm not interested particularly if it feels good or bad. <laughs> That's just judgment. I want to know uh, what happens. And likewise, in uh, the uh, so-called daily life, um, then that's uh, practice performance. So uh, that's not when we're necessarily doing uh, the work on the cushion. When those two come together, then uh, we have an interesting life. Your training, like the study here, will uh, not look like the practice performance of daily life. Just like the rehearsal of a musical piece uh, isn't going to look the same in a performance. Close, perhaps, but uh, it's different when you're doing your scales than when you're actually performing. And definitely, uh, uh, the training on the cushion is going to look different than daily life. Just like our inside of our body, um, our organs look different than our skin, right? <clears throat> I know there's a idea that the inner and the outer are supposed to look the same. Um, this is actually a dualistic view um, that is being squashed by a um, uh, monotheistic view. Uh, what we're uh, striving for is uh, a different view um, so that uh, the container, so to speak, uh, 
the enlightened awareness um, is unbiased to either the uh, formal training or the practice performance. But they're not going to look the same anymore than um, the inside, uh, you know, anatomy is going to look the same as the outside. So why am I talking this way is because uh, the Tathagata Garbha and Buddha Dhatu um, presentations in Mahayana is uh, uh, a bridge scripture, a bridge um, uh, text, uh, an explanation of trying to uh, uh, connect and weave together uh, these uh, the training world and the practice world. So uh, it's uh, an important uh, bridge from um, kind of a sutra approach uh, to a tantra approach. So to do uh, authentic tantra uh, and or including um, the Mahamudra and Dzogchen systems, which can be somewhat viewed separately sometimes as uh, it's necessary to uh, be talking about this Buddha nature. <clears throat> so let, let me just stop right there and um, see if I'm making any sense. If someone has a, um, a quick question or comment <clears throat> about training and practice and uh, what's in the middle <clears throat> or what um, ties them all together. I agree with everyone together. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Lama, excuse me, yeah. Lama. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, could you um, explain again the difference between the practice? So you you do the training and then you do the practice, but then you said something about the performance, and the performance is different than the practice. Practice and performance, same thing. Oh, they're the same. Okay. Yeah. So there's training and then there's practice performance. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lama. Uh, um, so called daily life, I like to call it that, is um, uh, we're not in control of the situation so much. Do you agree? Whereas yes. uh, in the training aspect, um, we're trying to have as much control as possible. Okay. So uh, uh, enlightened awareness um, is this uh, interesting um, matrix of uh, um, not in control and in control world like that. To say you're out of control or you're in control, I mean, either, either side is very dualistic. So um, we say that uh, you're, you're embracing both the um, out of control world and the in control world. Thank you, Lama. Right. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'll meditate on that. <laughs> so I uh, have to, you know, give this broad outline so that uh, the text is seen in its depth and not just explaining terminology. And uh, it's understood from the standpoint of uh, our whole Dharma journey like that. So uh, uh, off, <laughs> off stage, Connor said, well, how do you blend the two? And I said, well, if you had to write an essay, how to blend the two, uh, from from the Indian point of view, from Maitreya and Asanga's point of view, you would be writing this uh, Uttara Tantra Shastra. This would be um, uh, the essay, okay? <laughs> uh, anybody else right now? Uh, um, 
Oh, I'm sorry, Karen, do you want to say something? Or? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Lama, <clears throat> when you say that the uh, practice is, is, is a bridge between sutra and tantra, uh, do you mean to suggest or something like that we're going to try and maintain the concentration or the intensity of our practice at the same time we're going to be in a relational field? We're going to be dealing with stuff. We're going to be interactive, so to speak. Well, just uh, the way I'm using the term is training the formal sadhana is everything that we do on the cushion, so to speak. You know, like I'm doing these prayers, I'm reading this text, I'm doing this meditation, I'm doing this ritual. That's all formal training. So we try to do it as perfectly as possible, right? Then there's your daily life, and I call that practice performance. It's uh, performance because we're just on the spot and we have to do something. It's practice because it's not going to be perfect the way training looks like. So the text is... Uh, you know, a Maitreya or a Sangha's essay to say, how do we unite uh, training and practice? How do we unite the formal training and the performance aspect of our lives like that? Because most um, lower vehicles or maybe most people think, well, you just try to make them match up, right? You try to... Um, uh, be consistent. Well, you try to make your daily life look like your training, right? Yeah. That's wrong. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, so that kind of uh, perfectionist dharma is what, um, uh, you know, uh, is being criticized in the... Um, Heart Sutra, I give it up. Shariputra, you, you're just, you can't do it. <laughs> it's kind of a slam dunk, like just, you know, put it all down, give it up, okay? That's not the way it works. So, um, Kiteshvara, you know, uh, is, uh, you know, blending how they're interacting. So this um, interaction, this uh, uh, middle way um, between the training, the perfectionist world and the performance world uh, is gonna be that matrix, that garba, that womb, uh, so that um, the Buddha nature uh, that we're talking about is this, um, you know, complete uh, uh, attempt to talk from the aspect of totality like that. <clears throat> well, Ms. Roberta, I have a question. Yeah. So if um, you're doing this sort of spontaneously as you're interacting with your practice and your performance, isn't there some feedback you need to know is this what it is is it what it's I don't know it's if supposed to be is the right word but how do you get a sense that you're on the right track I mean we can certainly kid ourselves a lot so you have the training we get proper instruction how to do all the meditations and then uh, we uh, notice how uh, we're doing daily life. And then you put the two next to each other. And uh, usually we're trying to flip those or, <laughs> or, or make them be the same, but um, actually you just put them together but uh, you, you don't know quite how to hold them together. So that's the role of uh, the lineage and the teachers and, and our Sangha 
uh, also. So usually we're highly um, fascist toward our experience, like we just want to get rid of the part of us we don't like uh, and make everything perfect, or maybe we're anti-Buddhist and just want to make everything <laughs> chaotic, but um, uh, we're not able to tolerate that um, uh, the, the full story is, is going to be this uh, interesting mix of uh, practice performance and training. But uh, I know most people are always trying to make their daily life look like um, this perfectionist thing, right? And we don't want to do it that way. Should we have yeah. some evaluation portion of it, though, to know that, or is it is it always we would go back to you to say, is this kind of how it is? Or, I mean, it just feels like you do the training and you do the um, performance part, but that doesn't, I mean, for me at least, I, I'm not sure that I still know if I'm getting it. Uh, you know, we do need, you know, qualified people, qualified teachers to uh, point out like when we're uh, holding them together in the same bowl, the same room. Uh, and uh, that's generally going to be in an actual now present experience, right? So uh, then we learn how uh, to uh, do it ourselves, basically. So, uh, you know, what, what, what or who is the real Lama, Roberta? That's, that's important, right? Yeah. So uh, the real Lama isn't going to be uh, the outer Lama, of course, necessary, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the, uh, so I know some people um, uh, are aware of uh, Dujan Rinpoche's wonderful poem before his uh, short Nindro practice, and he talks about finding the different levels of lamas. You know, that might be something I could talk about in the future. But uh, the inner lama, right? Uh, we have to be introduced to generally by the outer lama, <laughs> like that. Okay. So uh, that's why we actually have to spend some time. Like, uh, I'm, I'm still trying to learn Tai Chi um, or be Tai Chi uh, with Robert Nakashima, but um, I have to actually do the training on my own and then train with him too, because I can look at books and videos, but it's not enough like that. I have to be kind of corrected uh, in the moment like that, or pointed out like this, you're actually doing it right now. <clears throat> That's why um, actually it's difficult to have too many actual intimate students that are really, really doing the pra practice and training um, because um, uh, no teacher uh, uh, really can meet with thousands of people, right? So an incredible teacher like Guru Rimshe, you know, really just had 25 students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think Dirk's going to give a talk on Yeshe Sogyal um, sometime in the New Year's, you know. Uh, who's was able to spend a lot of time with uh, uh, you know, Guru Rinpoche, of course. So without Yeshe Salgo, we wouldn't have many of Guru Rinpoche's teachings. Thank you, Lama. Yeah. <laughs> Lama, this is Susan. Um, so that's why Samadhi, that's why Shamata is so important so that if you you have the clarity to cultivate the inner lama to really see if you're holding the two together without 
being distorted by your own your own um, delusions. Uh, right. So, uh, you know, with us, of course, we're doing still you're doing a shamatha from uh, a highest level perspective, right? So when we're doing shamatha, it's like we're, you know, like at the base camp of of the mountain, but you know we're looking all the way up the mountain. You know, it's not just like we're going to do shamatha and then just stay at the uh, foothills. You know, but uh, what we don't want to do from the very beginning is uh, uh, stray stray overly into uh, very dualistic thinking. So dualistic thinking isn't just that. Um, which is mistaken thinking like uh, dualistic thinking, people think like, well, there's no self or other or subject object. Uh, it doesn't mean that, it means that uh, actually one side is winning out over the other. So there's an inherent aggressiveness and misknowledge when we, we posit like two things and then we try to uh, eliminate uh, something. So in shamatha, uh, we're learning how to stay calm and present um, uh, with uh, and, and balance, uh, you know, excitement and, and uh, lethargy, right? Well, actually, what what I was yes, but what I was thinking of is is there's that that four part. Uh, the, the four pieces that are necessary that they talk about in the first chapter of devotion to the Dharma, compassion, samadhi, and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And the samadhi is, the, is there so that you can not get confused. Yeah, samadhi is sometimes, you know, one-pointed concentration or... Um, you know, complete absorption sometimes translated that way. So, uh, yeah, the, uh, you know, we could say like, yeah, shamatha is the kind of, you know, is, is uh, you know, going to uh, help you develop samadhi like that. That makes sense, right? Because it's completely, mm -hmm. completely yeah. stable. Okay. <laughs> yeah, completely stable and clarity, right? So, um, if you're looking deeply into Lake Tahoe or the sky or something, uh, you, you might forget that you're standing there looking at the sky, and it, it just becomes, you know, the, the sky. But it's not like it's not like you're getting rid of yourself. You're you're still there, but um, you're not over and above. You're not over and above the sky. The sky's not over and above you. So it's a perfect sense of peace. So there's a samadhi. So if we think of pe samadhi as peace, it might be more useful than blanking something out. You know, it's just really peaceful, a very all-encompassing. So it's like very famous sutra that's big in China, Sir and Gama Sutra is like ocean-like samadhi. It's like, it um, contains everything. Like there's absolutely no struggle. So that's one of the most interesting parts about the Shastras um, uh, going into the actual lack of struggle of the, the Buddha qualities or the Buddha nature uh, with delusion. This is an important point. So maybe some of you have already started reading. Um, I hope so. But uh, one of the interesting ways it is languaged is uh, there doesn't seem to be really a sense of struggle when when we're reading it. Sometimes when we're reading some texts, there's or talking to some people, the emphasis is on struggle, right? There just seems to be no struggle. Uh, and, and that's really an important piece. That's why I say it's very, we should, we should be reading uh, 
the Shastra after we're struggling with Madhyamaka, after we're struggling with tenets or something like that. So I wanted you to read this uh, before you uh, read in logic or um, epistemology of Dignaga and Dharmakirti so that when you're studying these formal things, there's not a struggle. Mm -hmm. um, Derek asked the question in the chat. Um, are you saying that? Are you saying yeah, also, I can't read the chat, so thank you. Yeah. For, are you yeah. saying also there is an ideal version of bodhicitta and then a relative version of bodhicitta? Well, uh, are you are you meaning to say Buddha nature, or you mean really mean bodhicitta? Jack. having some internet challenges, maybe both. So of course, you know, we talk about bodhicitta, the um, aspiration, spirit of awakening from a relative point of view, absolute point of view. But um, uh, as we read the uh, Shastra, um, of course there is the two truths there, but they, they don't seem, they seem more um, integrated, wouldn't you say? Has anybody read through it yet? Yeah, read through it and see what um, see what you say. Like Zima's waving hi. So uh, <clears throat> uh, it, it's not it's it seems more integrated to me. So that's important. So much of just an aside. So much of um, uh, Buddhist uh, presentation particularly Mahayana and Vajrayana, is going to be um, how uh, people understand the two truths, right? Uh, you know, how they're distinguished, but also how they're integrated like that. So, so this is important. The Buddha nature uh, discussion doesn't have such a, um, it's more uh, kind of, we're all in this um, big uh, vase or a big uh, container. And that's one aspect of uh, the Tagata Garvin is this, this big container, right? This big uh, holding environment, uh, this big, uh, uh, you know, uh, matrix, this big room. Uh, the other aspect, uh, the Buddha Dhatu is, uh, the complete liberation side of it. But um, the part I wanted to concentrate today is the idea that uh, these um, aspects are all uh, contained together. <clears throat> so of course, uh, some people that have done some reading uh, or practice ahead of time will probably notice that I am following along uh, with the commentary of uh, Duncan Control and Kepel Sultring, which is very much a uh, Mahamudra and Dzogchen approach, isn't it? If you recognize the Dzogchen approach there, you should, right? So um, uh, from Dzogchen point of view, um, uh, the Alia, um, the ground consciousness, the enlightened, uh, the primordial, uh, Alia is both the um, uh, the ground of both samsara and nirvana, like that. So uh, for today's discussion, I'm I'm taking that kind of uh, viewpoint, uh, which I do generally anyway. <laughs> so that's easy. But um, I want people to understand that uh, there there are some other viewpoints, you know. So uh, uh, of course, there's very strict. Uh, uh, Prasanka, Madhyamika viewpoint, and other more yoga char and viewpoints, and so forth. But um, uh, you know, particularly want to extend the viewpoint that exists in the com commentaries by John Gimpantro and Kempo Sotra. Yeah, what is it that connects samsara and nirvana? What what is it that holds them both? You know, so uh, Buddha nature. Hmm. How are we doing for time? Let me see. 
So, um, really Lama, would, yes. Would yes, you sir. say that Buddha nature and nature of mind are two different things? Uh, not really. <laughs> uh, so usually, you know, when we're saying, um, uh, you know, nature of mind, um, we're uh, trying to point out, uh, you know, uh, absolute purity of mind, you know, uh, from John Gunn Cultural's point of view or Kipo's treatment, you know, like that. Um, where when we're talking about Buddha nature, uh, it has the nature mind purity, but we're also talking about how uh, it expresses and uh, functions and how delusions work. But when you read things that talk about nature mind, and then you read Buddha nature, um, a lot of times they don't seem that much different, but um, definitely when we're talking about nature mind, we, we wanna make sure that you get this um, emphasis on the um, empty luminosity aspect and the unceasing manifestation aspect. You know, so, uh, and of course, uh, the empty aspect, the sense of empty of other. But um, the Buddha nature is really interested in uh, uh, talking, I'm going on a little bit extra, but talking about uh, how uh, the nature mind, we could use that, the nature of the Buddhist mind affects and ripens beings, right? So um, it's possible to just uh, praise the nature mind and point to it, but how, how then does, um, how then does it actually work to teach and to awaken beings? You see, that's a big problem that uh, all teachers have. It's like, well, okay, but you know, um, I have this wonderful freedom and sense of uh, compassion and uh, joy in living, but um, how do I teach? How do I communicate that? Um, we know that the Buddha had his awakening experience um, after overcoming uh, one kind of doubt, but then actually had another kind of question. I don't know if I would call it doubt, but maybe he kind of said, well, I don't think, you know, he said, all beings are manifesting, we say then in the Avatamsaka Sutra, all beings are manifesting as my very own essence, the nature of Tathagata. Uh, so that's Tathagata Garbha right there, right? That's the whole thing right there. And, but then he goes like, but you know, this is sublime. This is, this is subtle. This is like going against the, you know, uh, the worldly <laughs> idea. What, what if I should just, you know, retire to the forest, right? So uh, then who knows what happened then? You should all know this, right? This is Dharma 101. Someone who hasn't but, talked before. The God, oh, okay. Yeah, well, okay. If you're, the you gods, ahead. Brahma and the gods asked him to teach. Yeah, so that's so, very interesting, right? So uh, maybe it was Indra or Chakra, or, um, but uh, they said, you know, there's, um, there's some beings that have just a little dust, you know? <laughs> so, uh, that's very interesting, right? So you think in a way like, okay, I'm enlightened, see the nature of mind. Uh, so I just, I'll just kind of walk into town and start sharing, right? But um, he had to walk around, do walking meditation around Bodh Gaya for about, you know, 49 days or something. And, and then had to walk all the way to Deer Park like that. So uh, from a functional point of view, the Tathagata Garbha, Buddha Dhatu, um, Buddha Nature Sutras, and this Shastra, like how, how does that actually work? How, how, can, um, how, can the, uh, how can we teach? And how is it that someone else's enlightenment can help and affect others, right? 
because we don't have, um, uh, you know, we're not we're not doing a, a Christian God thing or a Hindu God thing where the gods can insert themselves, right, and 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 change our karma or change history. So, if the Buddhists can only teach and manifest, uh, how how does it actually work? This is uh, really a big deal. Um, we're very getting very close to our hour. Um, would anybody like to have one last question or comment before um, we give you a break before the um, Manjushri? <laughs> So, uh, well, yeah, it's going to hard to know and unmute, right? So, um, even in just kind of ordinary life, uh, we have so many feelings and uh, so many uh, insights and so many things we want to share with others, don't we? And uh, it's so frustrating when um, you know people don't get us, or you know we say something and then someone obviously takes it the wrong way, and or someone says to us and we don't get it, right? Uh, so we have these just incredible joy and freedom, and we just want to, you know, even as ki starting as kids, we want to tell everybody about our world and how we see things, and uh, you know, there's there's a loss of innocence when we realize like damn, they, they just don't get me, right? They don't, they don't get it. So I, I'm trying to, you know, show them something, show my inner world, show how I see the world, and they just seem to be going around like zombies or they're attacking me or something, right? So uh, uh, has anybody else ever had that experience? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, the, um, the Buddha nature... Uh, Shastra we're reading and all the Buddha nature um, sutras and other writings are not just to uh, talk about how things are, but how things are communicated and how things are realized. Yeah. So that's really deep because we can all be, you know, we can say, well, great, I'm enlightened, but um, <laughs> I like what Kenjin Rinpoche said, like a couple of uh, weeks ago when he was on, we're talking about emptiness, but that's kind of in yellow system. That's a little buzzword for realization or enlightenment. So he said, like, what good is it? You know, what good is it? If you can't ask her what good is it, then uh, we, we've got a problem. <clears throat> so uh, we should say goodbye here. And um, the Manjushi practice uh, is absolutely essential. Um, uh, so all the fantastic, great teachers uh, uh, ask us to do Manjushri practice and realize this loving wisdom mind. So uh, it's an intense practice. So I'm glad Dirk's leading it. And um, thanks for staying up late. <laughs> it's really good. And the moon practice um, on the Vajrasattva and moon practice is lovely. So. Uh, you know, people say, well, uh, sometimes they say, well, if I just had to do my meditation and uh, and I do, would just do these simple things I've talked about tonight, then uh, you can get there. But we must have uh, the pointing out instructions from a qualified teacher. Um, it sounds kind of like, oh my gosh, then I'm sunk. But um, if you do a lot of uh, your meditation on your own, a lot of the training on your own, and uh, hold your meditation training and your daily life together, then uh, some some great yogis have always only had to ask a couple of different questions because they were so right, you know. So that, that can save a lot of time with teachers, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll go home. I'll, I'll turn it over to... Uh, Manjushri and his representative. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy. Thank Bye. you, Linda. Yeah. See you. Yeah.
Thank you, Thank you Lama. Lama. Obviously, yeah. I haven't didn't think it through when I offered to do Manjushri tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's just right. I think it's just right. So this is a big night, the solstice, these planets in conjunction. Uh, so uh, it's very auspicious to do it. I think it's a really good idea, honestly. So nice to see you all. So I'll go off camera now. <laughs>